tumors to come out of your body. I command your blood levels to regulate in the name of Jesus. I address all trauma that's in your body. I command your bones to give up the trauma in the name of Jesus. I command rotator cuffs, rotator cuffs. Come on, if that's you right now, hold on. I saw the Lord, he, I saw him touching a rotator cuff. If that's you, if there's a rotator cuff injury due to a car accident or some type of a traumatic experience, shoot your arm up in the air and begin to move it. The Holy Ghost says, I'm addressing that right now. I heard the Lord say this while I was driving here. There are persons that have uh, issues in their nerves. I saw some uh, uh, issues regarding the nerves. Last night, the Lord healed a sister from neuropathy. Right before our very eyes. Tonight, if there's any nerve damage in your body, I decree by the power of the Holy Ghost that divine correction hits your nervous system in the name of Jesus. And if that's you tonight, lift your voice, give him praise. Try to do something you couldn't do. Come on. Come on, do something you couldn't do. Come on, come on. Do something you could not do. Do something you could not do. That's right. Sciatic pain. If that's you, slip your hands all the way up in the air. Sciatic pain. Lift them up as high as you can go. I command now that the bulging disc would be reset in your body now. In the name of Jesus. Listen, I am not a theorist. I'm a practitioner. I want to tell you something that happened with my mother's body. She fell down the steps and went to the doctors and got x-ray. The doctor said, ma'am, your spine is completely out of alignment. You're going to need surgery. She brought the report and the x-ray to the house of God. Say to the house of God. We command the spine to realign. She goes back to the doctor. The doctor does a second x-ray. He said, ma'am, this can't be the same spine. What happened with your spine? It shifted back into alignment. I'm here to declare to you the same power that's able to align my mother's spine is in this room tonight. And we say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, Lord. I set you free from the spirit of terror. There are at least 10 of you in this room. The enemy torments you with the thought of you dying from what your parents died from and your grandparents died from. But tonight, the spirit of the Lord shuts the mouth of the spirit of torment. And what your mother and your grandfather dealt with will be destroyed in your body and in your bloodline tonight. In the mighty name. Go home and go to sleep tonight. Go to your doctor's room. Go, come on, keep your doctor's appointment. Go back and watch the report change. Oh, Lord. Does somebody say anything can happen in this room? One more time, say anything can happen in this room. I got to preach. If you believe that, clap your hands, give Jesus praise. We'll come back. We'll come back. Oh, yeah, we'll come back. Woo! Hallelujah. While you're celebrating, can you bless God for Apostle Tim and Pastor Asia? Come on, y'all. Y'all better celebrate them. Come on, don't make me beat you. Come on, celebrate them. And, and to my wife, my queen, um, my armor bearer, my driver for today. <laughs> Pastor Raquel Patterson, I thank you, baby, for being here tonight. Super honored. I've been on the road a lot, and every time she gets a chance to come with me, I just feel like I'm going to preach better. Better and faster, okay? 
Okay, let, let's, 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 let's do some work tonight. Be seated. There is a word in the house, and there's also a move of God in the house. If I can get a tad bit more on these monitors, if you don't mind, guys. I've been throwing my voice, and I want, thank you, appreciate that. Um, I, I, I want to, I feel like I don't even need to do this. All right, just go to the table. We got books and stuff. Uh, yeah, we'll do all that later. There you go. Can you give those two to uh, the bishop and Pastor Lee? Um, go to our table. We have books, teachings, all type of stuff. I want to get straight into this, y'all. Uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 is where I want to hang out um, for a few moments. And you can, you can pad until I, until we settle in. Matthew 16, verse 14 through 18. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And I'm going to tell y'all. What the Lord's about to say tonight is about to shock us. The Lord confirmed his word when I pulled up close to the building and I almost crashed my car. I could not believe it. So when I get halfway through my message, you'll see why. All right. Matthew 16, 14 through 18. Also grab Genesis 22, verse 17. Genesis 22, verse 17. Matthew 16, 14 through 11. And Genesis 22, Verse 17, to all of the Ascension Gifts leaders here, God bless you. Thank you for coming to celebrate uh, Pastor and the Well Church and Apostle. It's always a good thing to have uh, ministry companions. Matthew 16, 14, and 18. And I'll go right to it. Verse 18, and I tell you, Peter, Petros, large piece of rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades the power of the infernal region, why y'all laughing, shall not overpower or destroy it. Amplified says, or to be strong to its detriment or to hold out against it. Go to Genesis 22, verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. I want to read that again. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Holler at the neighbor beside you. Say, neighbor, there's a gate that you must possess. For a subtopic, I want to talk about um, an apostolic mandate. An apostolic mandate. I want to talk to you not uh, as a people who are under the covering or authority of a, a sentient gift pastor, but I want to I wanna reshelf the conversation tonight, and I want to have some apostolic dialogue, because I'm not just preaching to an apostle, I'm preaching to an apostolic people. The word apostolic or apostolos in the Greek um, is a word that did not derive from a, a, a church or religious context. In all actuality, the word apostolos uh, was a Greco-Roman emissary that was dispatched from Greece or to Rome uh, with a navy or a fleet of ships to go and colonize a neighboring uh, geographical location or even conquer a neighboring nation or tribe. The pur purpose of the apostolos was to represent a government, was to represent uh, a sovereign authority, and to replicate the nature and culture of Rome or Greece in the conquered place. In other words, the way Rome and Greece, more specifically Rome, operated is that you don't have to come to Rome to see Rome. If we send an apostolos into the conquered area, he can decorate, he can build, establish to the point that you'll see Rome in a place that's not Rome. So the purpose of the apostle is to carry a culture that is not germane uh, to the location that he is sent to. But he is carrying a culture to implant it, to establish it, so that that place looks exactly like his native land. Here's why Jesus is called the chief apostle, because he comes from heaven, and everywhere he goes, he establishes the culture of heaven to the point that people wanted heaven, not because they saw heaven, but they experienced heaven on earth. Now... That's the job of the apostle, but by reason of you being under an apostolic covering, that means you also have the propensity uh, to establish, enlarge, and 
decorate your sphere of influence with the co oh God, the colors, the complexion of the kingdom of God everywhere you go. It's not just enough that you have an apostle, but you must become an apostolic people. Say apostolic people. But in conversations regarding the apostolic and planting and pioneering, we also must pull in the conversation of geography. And I'm not talking about spiritual geography because most of the time when we talk about possessing land and territory, it's usually in the context of the spirit realm. But, but I, I, I want to bring the conversation back to the terrain, all right? Because in scripture, there's a concept, if you're taking notes tonight, called cosmic geography. Say cosmic geography. Here's what cosmic geography is. If you have a Deuteronomy 32 worldview, you would really understand what this means. Cosmic geography is nothing more than fallen beings laying claim to physical territory. Uh, the question is asked, well, who are these fallen beings? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to open up a discussion tonight. I'm going to take you to Genesis, the chapter 6, uh, where most of us get a snapshot into the mood of God. God is seemingly in a bad mood because he's looking at his creation and he's saying, I have to reset this. I got to reset this for several reasons. Genesis 6 says, and there were giants or Nephilims in the land. Now, these Nephilims were hybrid beings. They were the offspring of angels being intimate with the daughters of men. Y'all hang with me. And for this reason, uh, the Bible says these giants begin to defile all of God's creation to the point that everything was messed up. Except a man by the name of Joe, of Noah. Notice what the text actually says. It says, Noah, his generations were pure. The word generations in the Hebrew, hang with me guys, this is just introduction. The word generations in the Hebrew actually means genes. What was the writer trying to communicate? That literally these fallen angels had corrupted all of God's creation to the point that they were tampering with the genetic code and the DNA. Hang with me. Uh, a good snapshot into this uh, uh, would, would, would be taken from an extra biblical book that was not considered to be canonized with the original 66 books of the Bible. It is a book that is revered as commentary, especially in uh, uh, Eastern religions, even such in Judaism. It's the book of Enoch. Say the book of Enoch. Now, I'm going to traverse through this very gently because I don't want to preach this as if it is canonized scripture. I want to preach this as if it was, say, commentary. In Enoch chapter 6 and in Enoch chapter 8, there is a more of a, a micro view of what happened when the angels were dispelled or kicked out of heaven. The Bible says that they were dispatched to a mountain, Lord help me to keep it, calm, keep it calm here, dispatched to a mountain that goes by the name of Hermon. Okay, by the name of Hermon. Hermon. Now, it's called Hermon because Hermon actually means sacred. It means dedicated. But what did they do once they were cast down to Mount Hermon? Well, Enoch 6 and Enoch 8 says that they bowed themselves to oaths. What were the oaths? We are going to mess up God's created order. Not just mess it up, but we're going to teach man how to consult the stars. We're going to teach them how to make weapons. We're going to teach them how to uh, tap into realms of the spirit apart from Jehovah God. We're going to teach them such wickedness, grotesque wickedness, that God is going to look at it and say, I want to destroy the entire world. Now, all this happened at the Mount of Hermon. Say Hermon. Now, now, this is interesting to the conversation of cosmic geography because Hermon was dedicated to the host of fallen angels. Demonic activity broke out on the Mount of Hermon. Let, let's just go through uh, history just for a quick moment and let's see uh, what was happening at Mount Hermon. Are you with me? What was happening at Mount Hermon? Well, Deuteronomy th uh, chapter 3, verse 8 through 11 shows us a bit of what happened after the angels claimed Mount Hermon as their central headquarters. Deuteronomy 3, 8 verse, uh, through verse 11 says, And there was a king by the name of Og of Bashar. Now, the king of Og, hang with me, guys, I'm going to preach in 10 minutes. The king of Og of Bashan was the king of the Amorites. He hung around, or his workshop, rather, was in the Mount Hermon region. What was so notable about the king Og? The Bible says that his bed was very unique. 
the bed was huge. I mean, a huge bed that spoke to his stature. He literally was a giant. He was a descendant of fallen angel relations. Hang with me. But he chose this place to set up his throne. If you keep going through history, 1 Kings chapter 18, I'm doing this for a reason, 1 Kings chapters 18, 19, it suggests that this mountain, Hermon, was dedicated to Baal worship. 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, it says once the kingdom of Israel was torn in half, Jeroboam erected a golden calf in the mountain of Hermon. Keep going. By the time we get to 300 B.C. to 200 B.C., the site was taken over by the Greeks. And the Greeks dedicated this site to what was called pan worship. Say pan worship. What was pan worship? I'm almost done. I know y'all said that's a lot of information. Hang with me. Pan worship was the worship of a stag god. He was half goat and half human. Sounds like what happened in Genesis 6. A mixing of DNA. So it was dedicated to the defilement of God's creation. What was happening on Mount Hermon in 300 B.C. through 200 B.C.? Well, there was a dedication or an altar that was established at Mount Hermon. The dedication was in honor to Pan, the fertility god. What would they do on this mountain? Well, they would take babies and they would throw babies in the mouth of the cave where there was a wa there was water and they would do this to get some type of favor or reward from the god of Pan. What else was happening in this place? There were goat mating. There were men having a, a, a bestiality, engaging in type of a lascivious sexual acts with animals right here because uh, under Understand how the dark world operates that lead through perverted sexual intercourse that you can channel powers of spirits. I can't go there too far. And so all this was happening at the mountain of Hermon. They were dancing, celebrating, getting drunk. All of this was happening. By the time you get to Jesus' day, the, uh, the history records that Philip dedicates this place to Caesar Augustus. Watch it. So the name changes from Mount Hermon to Caesar. Caesarea Philippi. Now, 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 this is interesting because when we read into uh, Matthew chapter 16, what we just read, the Bible says that Jesus chooses to take his class to Caesarea Philippi. Now, I thought this was genius of Jesus, Tim, because first of all, Jesus was trying to ensure that his disciples did not eat the leaven of the Pharisees. If you read the previous verses, he says the leaven of the Pharisees is religious rhetoric with no experience and no power. So here's what Jesus was trying to do. Yo, I feel like preaching here. Here's what Jesus did. To ensure you guys didn't remain religious, I want to take you on a class trip. Now, now let, let, let's look at the psychology for a minute. Let me pay back some student loans. Uh, there's a theme called uh, uh, psychogeography. Say psychogeography. And psychogeography is the impact that a geographical region has on the psyche, the emotions, and the mind. Now, the, the disciples were experiencing a psychosis of psychogeography here. Here's why. Jesus, don't you know that we are Jews? We don't go to perverted places like this. Because if we touch the unclean, then we run the risk of becoming unclean. So why in the world would you want to have a class in a dirty place? What do we have to learn here? Why couldn't we learn this lesson in Jerusalem? How come when we couldn't use more of a sterile environment? What are you trying to teach us? Well, Jesus brings this lesson to life. He says, I got to ask you one question now. I need you to pay attention. Tell somebody say, pay attention. Pay attention because you're going to miss the lesson because you're so bent out of shape that you're here. You don't even belong here. You, 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 you see mating of, of animals. You see babies being thrown. You hear the cry of innocent babies as they're dying and they're drowning in the river out of the mouth of the cave. Uh, I can imagine the disciples, Tim, are asking, what are we supposed to learn in all of this noise? Can I pause here parenthetically? Jesus has a way of teaching you lessons and growing you up in in places that aren't conducive to your present state. Meaning he'll teach you on territory that is antithetical to who you think you are. Why 
watch what Jesus was doing. He said, pay attention, y'all. I want to teach through the static. I feel like preaching. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know it's static in your life. But you better learn to hear him through the noise. Some of your greatest lessons from God will be taught through the noise. Some of the greatest moments of heaven include static and interference. It is not the moment for you to check out of the classroom, but it's time for you to focus. Watch this. Be seated. Hold on. Let me finish the introduction. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Now, remember now, we're having this class trip at the mountain where fallen angels fell 200 and bound themselves to an oath that we will defile all of God's creation. I thought this was genius of Jesus. The first thing he asked him, he says, who do men say that I am? Some of them say, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say that you're a scholar. Peter gets the revelation through the noise. I need y'all to catch this. <laughs> there is a remnant that can hear through the noise, y'all. I, I'm, I'm telling you that there is political noise come on there is social noise but you better be sure your ear is tuned into the frequency of the spirit to hear through the noise now watch this Peter says I got the revelation through the noise I could preach that tonight he says thou art the Christ the son of the living God now listen to what Jesus says now, now this is why this conversation almost made me crash my car because when I pulled up to an intersection, I saw that the well church is right at Mount Hermon. I'm trying to keep it together. I really am. You, you, your church, now let me get to the text. The Bible says, here, watch what Jesus says. He, he says, he says, I, I want to do something regarding my church and the position and the power of my church. I want to build my church on this rock. Now watch this. Proper exegesis. There are three particular interpretations of the sex. One is that Jesus is saying, I will build my church on the profession that I am the Christ. Second interpretation is that I'm going to build my church on Peter. We know that's bogus because Peter was not the founder of especially the Gentile church. Can't go there. But there's a third interpretation that pulls everything I just said together. Actually, Mount Hermon was called Gibraltar or a rock. So what Jesus was saying is where I want to put my church is Mount Hermon. Here's the issue with what was just saying. You could have planted a church anywhere, Jesus. But why do you want to put the church at the base, at the headquarters of wickedness? Okay, can I pause here for a second? I, I, I am afraid that the 21st century church has lost its backbone. We much rather have plus churches in places that don't disturb our peace. Come on. But, but, but what Jesus is saying, that my church was never supposed to be in pristine places. I need my church right in the face of demonic and satanic activity. Y'all not hearing me. I don't want to plant my church across the street. I want to put it right in the face of the enemy. So, so think it not strange that the well church is positioned at Mount Hermon. <laughs> oh, I need you to hear me. I, 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 know, I know there was great warfare acquiring this location. And, and I know you guys dealt with a lot regarding this location. However, it was by divine orchestration that the, here's the problem. There are many churches that God could have put at the base. There are many churches that God could have put at the gate. But he chose to put the well at the gate. Here's what this means. That when God wanted to make an offensive move against the principalities of the region, you are the peace that he chose. That's why it's not easy as it is for other churches. And, and I, I, I know, I know, you're saying, well, well, Apostle Tim, well, why couldn't I have it like them? How come I couldn't go that way? How come it's not, it's not easy course for me? 
it's because God never designed you to, oh God, for an easy route. Come on. He was trying to make you a tool, an offensive weapon in his hand. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, do you know where you worship? You don't worship at Old Ship of Zion Baptist Church. You worship at an apostolic epic center that has been positioned at the gate of hell to disturb the activity of this region. Hey. 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 I know some of you drive right past Mount Herman all the time. Don't even realize that name, y'all. That, that, that name speaks to the satanic workshop of the enemy. And the conversation is to defile all of God's creation. Now, 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 let me put this where you can get this. <clears throat> Watch this. Satan has plans for this region. Satan has plans for the eastern shore. He has plans for Salisbury. There has been a spirit assigned to this region to kill leaders. Y'all hear me? There's been a spirit assigned to this region to oppress the people of God. It's a strong spirit of oppression and depression. Actually, I heard the Lord just say, there's actually a spirit assigned to this region to cut men's time in half. But here's what the Lord says. The enemy did not bank on me planting a well church. Because by reason of you being here, you are running interception. Somebody's life is extended because the Lord put you here. Somebody's course has changed because the Lord put you here. Lift your hands and say, yes, Lord. Watch what Jesus says. He says, I will build my church right on this rock. Okay, sit down for a second. Now, 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 now let's take it a step further. Y'all good? Now, the well church, you are at an intersection, Mount Hermon and Civic Avenue. The word ecclesia or church, again, did not derive from a religious context. The ecclesia was a civic body. A civic body that was called out for the purpose of making executives decisions for the region. I've got to say this again because I feel like a part of our apostolic assignment is to properly identify what the church is. Y'all hear me? The, the church is not a social club. The, 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 the church is not a, is, watch this, contrary to popular belief, it's not a hospital. The, the, the church is a training center. Okay? It is a place where we teach you how to employ your weapons and demonstrate your divinity while you're here in the earth realm. So, so watch this. The ecclesia was a body that determined the economy of a position of a particular government. They determined, watch it, if we were going to war or if we weren't going to war. They decided who will be elevated in our city and who will be left to their corner. In other words, the ecclesia was a deciding body, a decision-making body regarding political, economic things in a region. I'm here to tell you well, church, that God has not just given you spiritual authority, but he's about to lay on this house political authority. Okay, let me keep going with this. Not just political authority, but you're going to have influence and presence in the various spheres of influence in this particular region. Here's why. Watch this, y'all. Watch this. Watch this. Well, church, better get ready because God's about to send high-profile people into this sanctuary. Not for you to ooh and all, ah, but because he needs them to be trained. He needs them to get apostolic hands on them so that they can execute their assignment when they go back to the boardroom. Take it a step further. It's the decision-making body, meaning that we have the power to control the climate of the region. Come on, I, I, I got to wake up this church today. I got to wake you up. 
what, please do not think that what you do here when you gather is just for here. While you are interceding, you are dispatching angels into various corners of Salisbury. While you are worshiping, your worship is jamming up satanic communication. Come on, Jesus. Okay. While you're here praying that literally God is stepping off of his throne and he is releasing his power and his hands into the affairs, the government affairs, the education affairs, the political affairs, because you chose to do something as the church. Uh, let, let me put this right here, and I'm, I'm almost finished. God was saying to his people, or Jesus was saying to his people rather, that I'm going to use my church to shift things. Say shift things. Now, now, now watch this. I'm almost done. Thank you for sitting through my introduction. Here's the message. Genesis 22. God tells Abraham, your descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. Jesus says in Matthew 16, the gates of hell won't prevail. Okay, let's say that again. I gotta say it again. Genesis, God says, you'll possess the gates of your enemy. Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail. Make this plain, preacher. Well, gates are designed for two reasons. Number one, gates are designed to keep things out. Say, keep things out. Which means by reason of you being dispatched to the gate of this region, the gates of hell or the demonic gates set up to resist the move of God will no longer be able to resist it. i got to say that one more time. The resistance will no longer be able to resist the move of God in this region because you're here. Here's the second meat of the gates. According to the scriptures, gates were the place where high profile people gathered. It was the seat of influence. If you were somebody, you sat at the... Here's what the Lord is saying. That your descendants are going to possess the gates that those who are carnal and don't know me currently occupy. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Uh, okay, apostle, prove your case. Well, um, uh, touch your neighbor and say, you better pay attention to this. God tells Abraham, Lord, please help me to keep this together. He tells Abraham that your descendants will be in bondage for 400 years. Until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Now, that, that's a strange passage, right? You, so God is prophesying or telling Abraham that your descendants are going to go into Egyptian bondage. Okay. Here's the reason why. Until the iniquity of the Amorites are full. What does that mean? Well, we would have to go over to Leviticus. Touch the neighbor, but pay attention. Leviticus says, and when the iniquity of the Amorites became full, that the land began to vomit them out. <laughs> so God kept the children of Israel in bondage until the land that belonged to them got sick of its current inhabitants. Here's why when God told Joshua to take Canaan, he said, drive them out. Drive them out because the land no longer responds to them. They can't even reap or eat from the land anymore because it came, became so sick of illegal squatters being there. And the Bible says, and the land became so sick that it spewed out into the What am I saying to you today? There are illegal squatters at your gate. Somebody right now is occupying a seat that belongs to you. There's an office that belongs to you. They're just decorating it and furnishing it just for you. But get ready because the gate actually belongs to you. Okay, I, I, I feel the anointing in this room. Hear me, Tim. It, you're not going to get the position because you're smart. You're not going to get the position because your resume was good. You're going to get the position because the gate realizes that who is there right now don't belong there. They were just holding space for the real custodian. Turn to your neighbor and say, but there's a gate that belongs to you. There's a millionaire club where that you're supposed to be a part of. Oh my God. There are deans that you're supposed to run with. There are Fortune 500 companies that you're supposed to rub elbows with because that's your gate.
I, I'm going to say something that's going to frustrate some religious folk in this room. In this apostolic paradigm, he, Apostle Tim is not in a hurry to put a collar on everybody. Because some of you are not called to oversee this. There's actually a gate that you belong at. Y'all not hearing me? And I know because you're charismatic, we try to put a collar on you. But, but your charisma was supposed to be for Hollywood. Y'all not ready for this talk yet? See, we tried to make everybody preachers. But not everybody is supposed to hold the mic. Somebody's supposed to be behind the camera. Somebody's supposed to be in the DJ booth. Come on, y'all. But if you can just get to your game, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know who I am now. I tried to fit in with everybody else. I tried to do the church stuff. But there's a gate with my name on it that I'm supposed to possess because it belongs to the kingdom. Watch this, watch this. Almost done, watch this, almost done. Uh, uh, touch the neighbor and say, neighbor, there's about to be a shift in this room. I feel the anointing of God in this room. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Come here, um, sir, worship leader, come here for a second. Lord Jesus, here's what the Lord has to do with the church so that we can possess the gate. Jesus sees, come on up here for a second. Come here, yep, come on. Um, come here, brother, real quick. Come here real quick. Yep, come here. Come here. Yeah, you. Come here real quick. Watch this. Watch this. I preached this many years ago, but the Lord showed me, John, the word was ahead of his time. He said to me, he said, remember I said the harvest is right, right before the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest would send laborers. I had a conference many years ago called Ekbalo. Many years ago. Here's what the word Ekbalo means. Mess me up. Ekbalo does not mean a gentle sending. Go ahead on to your gate and your field. <laughs> That's not what ekbalo means. Now, please don't get offended, brother, when I do this, okay? All right? Face that way. This is what ekbalo means. Come back, bro. I can't do this with the church no more. Because y'all too slow. But I'm about to stare up such an uncomfortability in the earth to the point that I'm about to push you towards your gate. Turn to them and say, but it's not rejection. It's God pushing me to my gate. I would have wasted time in the wrong place. I would have wasted energy doing things that were not a part of my call. But thank God for the... I need to go find somebody in this room right now. Tell them don't be offended by this. But I didn't tell you what the Holy Ghost is doing. He is pushing you out of your comfort, out of your depression, out of your apathy. Can you stand to be pushed? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. See, I don't do all that. I need to stop. Calm down. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. The Lord's about to do something that's going to offend your flesh. But your spirit man is going to be excited about it. Get ready for him to push you. I know you don't want to go. I know you're afraid. But the gate needs you. The gate's been crying out for you. Get in your position. Give me a piece of paper. Give me a piece of paper. Piece of paper, somebody. Horia Mandoma. The second meaning for Ekbalo is to. The 
The second meaning is, I don't know what this was. Here's what the Lord is saying. I have to violently tear my church. I have to, hear me, hear me, hear me. What does this mean, apostle? Do you guys not understand that the reason why every system is collapsing in the U.S. is because the church put too much faith in it. We were never supposed to be governed by the kingdom of men. We were supposed to be governed by the kingdom of heaven. So that you learn to depend on me again, I have to separate you. Now, 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 hear me. I know, I know, I know, I know. What I'm about to say is going to offend some people. I'm still in the text. I'll, I'll close it. I'm going to offend some people. Because this violent tear is going to come with some tears. It's going to come with some pain. There are some of you in this room right now who know that where you are, worship-wise, you ain't supposed to be there. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble. You already know that that well dried up. You already know that there's brown grass there. And the sad reality is that the shepherd has normalized brown grass. And God's been trying to get you to a place where there's green grass and fresh water. Touch your neighbor and say, but you heard God. Now don't make him tear you. I'm finished. He says, when I put my church there, when I violently push them there, the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell, the resistance of hell, the gates, the place of influence, won't be able to stand up once the church gets in their position. I need you to do me a favor real quick. I need you to tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, listen. We're about to do something real uncomfortable. Can you give me a marching cadence? A marching cadence. Come on, drummer. Heredito. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the cadence. God is setting the cadence of this house. Now, now, here's what I've learned. Apostle Tim, once God sets the cadence, there will be those who will try to march to a different cadence. That's why I said, don't get left behind. You got to keep up. Pick your feet up right now. Pick your feet. Come on, march in place. Pick your feet up. Pick your feet up.